Hello, friends, and welcome to Binge O'Clock, the podcast where we watch something and then we talk about it. I'm Joy Selden, and I've seen almost everything. I'm Danielle Nga, and I've seen almost nothing. And we're here today to talk about Kipo Season 2, Episodes 9 and 10, because we ran out of time last time. <laughs> whoops, whoops, whoops. And, you know, I, I, it would have been a disservice to the season finale, I think, to just blow through it in under in the under 15 minutes that we would have had to do. <laughs> Look, friends, we just really love talking about Scarlemagne, and yes. we're not here to apologize for that. Mm-hmm. We stand a well-rounded villain. Speaking of which... We find out quite a bit about another villain in these couple of episodes. Hey, Joy, are we going to spend an hour talking about Dr. Amelia? (laughs) I I almost want to be like, God, I hope not. Because because Dr. Amelia is like the true, like the true, you know, like the, like the, you know, the Emperor Palpatine Mm -hmm. behind the Darth Vader. You know, like nobody, (laughs) nobody really wants to talk about Palpatine. They want to talk about Darth Vader. Right, right. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> but we will spend I would I would wager probably a good deal of time talking about Dr. Amelia. But first, we have to pick up where we left off with the A team bursting mm-hmm. through to free Kipo and Kipo's just standing there. <laughs> and it's like, "Hi guys, welcome to the party." And fills them in on like, "So, Dr. Amelia is really the bad guy." And, you know, um, I'm going to hang here to see if I can, you know, see what I can. It's, it's so funny because I rewatched it again today and it's like, see what I can, you know, he really opened up to me. Scarlamine really opened up to me. And I, and I, you know, I want to see, sort of see what else he has to say and see if we can get closer. And then Wolf has the, so you can use his weaknesses against him later. Right. Mm-hmm. And she goes. Yeah. yeah, because of course, Kipo being Kipo, she actually thinks that she can just get through to him and kind of get him back over to her side because for, you know, at the end of the day, they're family, right? Exactly. What I appreciate about what I appreciate about the transition between episodes eight and nine is that the we don't hear that explanation. We don't hear Kipo's retelling of the story. Episode 9 picks up with she's done telling the story. And then everyone is just kind of reacting to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Dave's yeah. little, and I, the, I knew it. The first time I saw her, I said, Benson, that is an evil woman. <laughs> and Benson's just like, stop lying, just, man. Stop, stop lying, man. <laughs> stop lying. You've never said that. You've never said that. It's just... <laughs> I like Benson's, like, uh, not Benson. I like Dave's rewrite of history sometimes where it's just like, I knew the whole time. The whole time. No, you didn't. It's fine. (laughs) Nope. He thinks he knew the whole time. (laughs) I think that he genuinely thinks he knew, though. I know. Because he's Dave. Because he's Dave. Now, anyway, to your point, the party does split yet again. Thankfully, this sh- thankfully the show doesn't tend to keep the party split for full episodes. It usually has them coming back together either right at the beginning or at the end for a final right. f- for a final fight scene. But Kipo is going to stay here to quote exploit Scarlamagne's weaknesses, and everyone else is going to stop Doctor Doctor Amelia from getting to the coronation. Which my favorite part about that side of the plan is that Dave's job is to collect rocks because rocks are how you win a fight, and Wolf's how job you, how you fight. Dirty. How you, How you fight dirty. dirty. You collect rocks. You fight with rocks. And Wolf's job is to practice being nice. Which mm-hmm. is to practice doesn't... is to practice the the art. I don't know your evil plan. And I'm here as an unassuming teenager. Preteen. I don't know. I don't actually know how old Wolf is. The only person we know who's who's yeah, whose age is Kipo because she's 13 and it's in canon. But, like, I don't actually know how old Wolf <laughs> And I don't think Wolf knows either, because why would she? She probably right? doesn't. She's probably lost yeah. track. But she seems roughly Kipo's age, if maybe slightly younger. But the only reason I think slightly younger is because she's shorter, which isn't necessarily fair. <laughs> I know. It has almost no bearing on how old she is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's just shorter. <laughs> she's, she's just, just a petite, petite firecracker. <laughs> She's a she's a compact size, you know, extra, extra small. The practicing in the tunnels 
is probably one of my favorite moments in these two episodes. Just like si- favorite side quest moments. Mm-hmm. Um, of just, hi, Dr. Amelia, you want to kill my best friend? And I'm okay with that. It's <laughs> like, no, try it again. Take it from the top, bud. <laughs> so close. <laughs> Now, what works out really well for the team is that when they when when they successfully deceive Dr. Amelia, this is after Dr. Amelia discovers Mondu pretending to be Kipo, kind of accuses them of helping her escape. And they just they do the thing where the best lies have a kernel of truth. Right. And they just act exactly as angry and scared as they are, which is way more effective than acting nice <laughs> right yes like when Wolf- or or trying to like conceal the the fact that they know what's happening like try mm-hmm. what no but also when they you say know, like, like oh she ran away like that's not not right you know <laughs> and when wolf says if anything happens to her i'm gonna you know that was know. that was a genuine, genuine that was a genuine moment and so genuine threat <laughs> in my notes it says their deceive role was a success but i don't even know if this was a deceive role maybe it was more performance it might have been more performance it's hard to say whatever it was it worked um Ish. and i think dr amelia I mean, like, I feel like it worked because it it made way for the rest of their plan. Yeah, And Dr. Amelia completely underestimated them because Mm -hmm. they're kids. No, Uh, that's true. And, like, I I would underestimate a ragtag bunch of teens, you know, like, and you would would immediately think that their mega mute buddy Mm -hmm. is the muscle and that none of them have any kind of, you know, value. Which is exactly what she does. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. Because her whole evil plan is to kill Kipo after using her and her friends, right? So she's thinking like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to dupe these friends and have them go along with my plan. And then I'll get rid of them. Easy peasy, right? Exactly. It's hard for me to understand, but also I guess I have to understand because Dr. Amelia has survived on the surface, right? But not in the same way that Benson and Wolf had to survive on the surface. Because the thing or is... Or even like, Scarlamane. Or even Scarlamane. Because the thing is, like, if you look at Benson and Wolf, right? Some part of mm-hmm. you is like, dude, I know they're kids, but how, how, why, 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 why would you completely discredit two kids who somehow survived for like a decade by themselves on the surface? Like, obviously, these are actually highly skilled humans. And the only reason I can think of that Dr. Amelia doesn't understand that is because she spent most of her time in like this little high tech lab and was just in her little bubble and doesn't really get what it's like to survive on the surface. Right. But I don't know. Well, she also doesn't understand what it's like to survive alone. Mm. Because she definitely, like, I get the impression that she always has, like, she always has her henchmen. Yeah. She had her henchmen in her bro. She has her henchmen now. Mm-hmm. And she always had these other humans around her. I True. assume from the same bro. And it's like, it's not the, you have to survive by the skin of your teeth because you're small and you're weak. And you have to figure out ways, you know, ways to get get away ways to fight back way Mm -hmm. you know ways around the and i i to your point i love that like benson and wolf have found two completely different ways to do that (laughs) that's true because they are two completely different you know like they dealt with their situation in these very different ways Mm -hmm. and like dr amelia had help I mean, I'm assuming 13 years on the surface. I'm Something not sure like if they that, have right? another, because they kind of have, like, a warehouse. Yeah, yeah, like some sort of bunker, of? right? It, yeah. it feels like it's underground, but I actually don't, mm, I guess not, because it has that sort of outdoor training arena. Or maybe it's a mix, it's, maybe it's a mix of both, you know? I mean, it has, it obviously has access to tunnels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Look, I'm sure someone on the internet has figured this out where they're like, this is exactly like it almost feels like that, um, like an old subway station. Yes. Which I yeah. know if this is California, I know that's not exactly true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, you know, it feels like something like that or like an old, you know, elect, uh, like electrical conduit station where like you had to get down underground to like figure stuff out because it it has access to these underground tunnels. Mm-hmm. So... You know, maybe that's sort of what we're playing with this like half bunker, half 
just warehouse factory type thing. Yeah. Um, but like so she's she, she's been surrounded by people. By people. She has her shelter, like you said. And for some reason, they're like the only group of people in this universe that still use technology. Like that still have access to electronics. And I kind of like that's that's an interesting aspect, I think, to mm -hmm. introducing this team of players into the mix. I think so. Also, I mean, an, uh, another thing we can't ignore is that she is the boss of all of these people. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, she definitely leads by example. Like she's the one out there with the scouting party. Like she's out there with Greta and something. Shoot. I always forget the boy's name. I love <laughs> Greta. Greta's Greta's, Greta's pretty Gre spectacular. Greta needs to be protected at all costs. Greta who didn't know that breakfast could be hot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't, Zane. I don't think she, his well, name so, is Zane. Zane, thank you. Mm -hmm. Zane. Bless Greta and Zane. I love that Greta is just slightly more naive than Zane. Mm -hmm. And they're both worlds more naive than, than Dr. Amelia. So let's talk about like their the Dr. Amelia plotline before we get back to yeah, Charlemagne and Kipo. Because we're already here. So mm -hmm. Mondu is discovered, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. And I feel like the C plot in this is like Mondu trying to do, you know, team things and oh, failing. Yeah. Oh, because poor this Mondu. Isn't her, like this when, isn't her strong suit. Well, because she literally doesn't have opposable Fingers. thumbs. Like she can't help make the pancakes. She can't help carry plates. I like, know. All oh, that her face when Benson, Wolf, and Dave were the brunch bunch. I know. And they were just, and, and she was just completely excluded. Poor thing. I know. And you could really tell she was just trying to make herself useful like the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, I felt really bad for Mondu <laughs> in this episode. But I mean, so, she comes through. Look, she's she's a heavy in her own right. She just has to find her her niche. Right, exactly. So that's her C plot, right? But Benson, Wolf, and Dave are basically just trying to like play along with Dr. Amelia until they can get into the tunnel and blow it up before the coronation, right? right. They've created a fake vial of nectar in order to do this, and Dave is going to be the one who sets off the bomb because, again, immortal being, he's the only one who can do it without dying. And survive. <laughs> so Benson and Wolf are serving brunch, and Dave runs off into the tunnel to explode it. Yeah. Oh, and we I think we we missed this little part before is we switched the nectar. We yes. gave Dr. Amelia a bottle of perfume and the the nectar bomb is obviously being used for this I don't even know what you call it, this particular hijink. <laughs> this one singular hijinks. Um, now they were all in all they were fairly successful, right? They actually they they successfully they Oh, they trapped they trapped every single other human except for Dr. Amelia, which is not bad. Like no, I they guess. have the numbers. <laughs> I mean, I think the part of the the part of this that was most frustrating to me was mm -hmm. not that Dr. Amelia didn't get trapped in the tunnel because she is extremely smart and I think that that tracks. The part of right. this that was most frustrating to me is that day uh, is that Benson, who never not once in this show has ever abandoned his backpack for the sake of plot, leaves his backpack on a table so that Dr. Amelia can steal Song's the journal Kibo. from the backpack. Yeah. Which, yeah, listen, the Kibo Project Journal. This is also the one time in this the one time in this season that I think the show waited a little bit too long for a reveal that we all knew it was going to make. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> we all as soon as Doctor Amelia saw the backpack, saw the journal in the backpack, and as soon as Day Benson walked away from it, we all knew what was going to happen. Yeah. But the show waits an episode and a half to tell us that she does in fact have the journal. Yeah, and the, and I I agree with you. It's extremely frustrating because again, it did feel like plot device. Yeah, like not only did he leave his backpack unattended, he left it open and unattended. Yes, and up until that part in the episode, we actually didn't know all the pieces of the plan. Mm -hmm. We like we kind of like you know we got glimpses and we understood that the nectar would come into play. And we understood that, like, that would be the distraction and a blah, blah, blah. Like, we had those, but we had, like, broad strokes. Mm -hmm. So 
my brain was like, oh, they're going to like lure Dr. Amelia with this bait. Mm. Because Mm -hmm. again, like you said, he has never done this. Oh, so you thought that he had done that on purpose. Right. That would be every time I watch the episode. Yeah, every single time I watch the episode, I think that's what's going to happen. And then I remember that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So frustrating. I know. So frustrating. No, I know. I and I agree with you. It's it's one of those moments where like I don't usually get frustrated by things like that, but usually those things happen in like movies where the plot isn't extended so mm-hmm. that you don't actually see how people interact with a thing. Right. And you're yeah. like, oh, totally plausible. Like you're constantly reaching into your bag to grab stuff anyway because you're cooking or whatever. Like sure. You know, that makes sense. But like, as you said, he's never done this. Never. His backpack is basically part of his body. I know. It's It's like it's an extra. It's like a sack on his back. It's like it's like a skin sack on his back. Like he never takes it off because he's a scavenger. He's a hustler. That's how he carries baby Dave around. You know? Yeah. Like I just it doesn't. I'm way more frustrated by this than I should be. You're allowed to be frustrated by this moment of plot dumb. You know, like, it's that it's that running joke. In, well, wait, you haven't seen Galvant, have you? I've seen the first season. Okay, in season two, there's literally a thing where they're like, she has it. She's always had it. She's had it the whole time. Really? Mm-hmm. Are you sure? Yeah, no, she's had it the whole time. Mm. <laughs> and, like, it's a completely new thing for season two. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and they make fun of the trope of like how stuff just, you know, manifests. Mm-hmm. How anyway. all of a sudden you have a sister that no one's ever heard of before. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Comes out of nowhere. Mm hmm. But just like speaking of things that, like, what would have been a better explanation, right? Like, let's imagine a world in which Wolf was responsible for keeping an eye on the journal, right? And there was a moment where Wolf can either keep her hands on the journal or allow Stocky to be broken, right? Right. Like, that's, I don't know actually whether Wolf would have elected to save Stocky over the journal, but... I mean, you had it built into the episode. You could have Mm -hmm. had a moment where Mondu was, like, trying to be helpful and scavenging something out of his backpack. True. You know... And, and literally like left it open because, again, she has no thumbs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then couldn't tell anyone that the journal got stolen because she doesn't communicate verbally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, there are a lot I don't of other know. explanations just, for it. Or even if Kipo had forgotten it somewhere just because she is who she is. Like, I think it would have made more sense to me if Kipo had forgotten it somewhere than if Dave had forgotten. Dave or Benson had forgotten it somewhere. Yeah. Well, more Benson. More Benson than Dave. You're more right. Benson. You're right. <laughs> I don't trust. I don't trust Dave with the important plot. <laughs> the important plot point. He also doesn't have pockets or anything, so it's like, how would he keep it? At, how would he keep an eye on it? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. He like exploded into six different versions of himself, but somehow was able to still hold that nectar in that last episode. So I don't know what was going on there. The only anyway, reason. So- the only reason I thought perhaps Dave wouldn't have lost it is just because Dave is that character. You know, I think that well, he, that's also he is the character who somehow miraculously does the thing, even though he is wildly incompetent. <laughs> yes, I I a hundred percent agree with that assessment. That is for sure exactly what would have happened. But anyway, speaking of other frustrating moments, how do you feel about Wolf versus Doctor Amelia? <laughs> Well, look, it's a really good fight scene. They all give it, you know, give it 100%. Mm-hmm. I do love that they keep yelling each other's names, and even Dr. Amelia is like, you know what's helpful? Not doing that. Don't call each other's names before you attack. <laughs> like, before listen, you attack, maybe. It makes complete sense to me that she takes Benson and Dave out immediately, right? They're not yep. fighters. That's not who they are. Yeah. But for Wolf to get taken out by a blanket is Boo! Then again, though, the, the other reason, the, the other way I was thinking about it is that she was taken out because her weapon is handmade. And clearly what's happening is that when she's knocking Stocky against Dr. Amelia's weapon, Stocky has a lot more reverb than a weapon yeah. that's actually built to be used in that way. Like a weapon that's built to be a weapon, whereas mm-hmm. she basically just made like she's look, she's been really good with Stocky up until this point, but she hasn't really fought any people. Right. She's been fighting mutes. And she hasn't been fighting anyone who's 
is a trained fighter, which clearly Dr. Right. Amelia is. Exactly. Uh, so the team gets put into a cage, except for Mondu, thankfully. <laughs> Dave demands to be put in the cage. And then Dr. <laughs> I Amelia <forgot> about that. <laughs> breaks Stocky, which is so I know. sad. I really hope we get like a Stocky 2.0. Maybe like it's maybe it's like double scorpion tails or it's like <laughs> too little. I don't know. I don't know what I mean. I don't know what I want to see, but I want to see something cool. You know, like after yeah, Thor's fair. hammer was broken, we then get the pretty cool kind of double axe situation. Hatchet, like the giant yeah. axe thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like which was- I am also super into, mm-hmm. which is yeah. pretty great. So um, I'm excited for Stocky 2.0. I actually don't remember. I know she gets another weapon, but I can't remember. <laughs> don't tell me remember. what it is. <laughs> it's fine. We'll we'll find out together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But no, it is. It's a really sad moment because it's like this is the thing that has kept Wolf alive. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and it's and it has huge sentimental value. It's literally saved her life. It's like if somebody who saves your life constantly just died. Yes. You know, and it's it's you know I love it when. Uh, quote unquote characters like this are sort of born, you know, and like mm-hmm. they don't mm-hmm. have conflict. They don't really have anything. But man, do you miss them when they go? Yeah. Um, and yeah, they they end up sort of thwarting Dr. Amelia. I mean, Mondu takes her out pretty. I mean, yes. you know, Stocky gets like one last kick in, basically, <laughs> because yeah. Mondo uses Stocky's venom to take Dr. Dr. Amelia out. But you're right. She I mean. Ugh, listen, this is a show where the characters don't kill, right? So this isn't really like an always double well, tap situation. <laughs> well, the good guys anyway, right? The good guys. Because the good the guys truly, do not kill, yes. Yeah, I know. exactly. So it wasn't really an always double tap situation. But maybe yeah. they should have maybe they should have tied her up or something. Remember that? Anyway, they were in a hurry, so they didn't. <laughs> I I mean, you know, this is always in a dystopia where I'm just like, and then I would have left her in the wilderness to be devoured by mutes. <laughs> okay, here's the only thing that is slightly frustrating to me about this. Uh-huh. I I think it makes sense that they didn't. Well, obviously it makes sense that they didn't kill her. They didn't mm-hmm. stop to tie her up. Fine. They knew that they needed to the, to get to the coronation. Why wouldn't they take the sonic emitter? Oh it no! Was Great question. Right there on the table. She was clearly going for it. They know it's useful. They could use it against Scarlamane if they needed to. Why wouldn't they take the sonic? Why wouldn't you take the sonic emitter? You would think Benson would be the first one to grab that. He like, ooh, something useful. Grab it because he's Go. you know sound guy, sound yeah. guy, and also the scavenger of the group. Like you would think he would just grab that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a great question. You know, I can I can only imagine they didn't because plot. <laughs> they didn't grab it because plot. Look, I would have been super happy if it's like. You have the journal. We have your sonic emitter. If you want to feel safe, mm. swap with us or something. You know, I guess that's like fair. that could have been an interesting. That could have yeah. been like an interesting like trade trade. Like we really need the journal back, mm-hmm. and you obviously want the sonic emitter to feel safe from mm-hmm. mutes. You know, let's do tradesies. But they didn't do that. They no. just ran away. Yep. Add that to thing number two in this episode that irritated me, which I don't I don't feel I don't feel bad ragging on this episode necessarily (laughs) because I don't think I don't think previous to this episode I had nitpicked the plot of Kipo too, too much. But that's because and I I think that that's because it really was well written. Right. Mm -hmm. The plot up to this point didn't have a lot of these moments where I felt like they were doing things just to push the story forward. So I guess maybe I'm nitpicking because my expectations were so high. I mean, look, that's (laughs) entirely possible. But honestly, if it took you almost two whole seasons of 20 some odd episodes to get to a point where you're like, why are we doing this? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good run. No, you're right. You're right. (laughs) You know, they're allowed one or two little things. I feel like I feel like you're allowed to be miffed about a thing that's like trying to wrap up, you know, and and a you know a, a season finale, and it, maybe it's doing it a little bit a little bit sloppy, where mm-hmm. everything else has been so concise. Mm-hmm. Because again, the show is nothing but plot, and yeah. you have to pay attention to the plot. And this these particular plot points are just, you know, they're they're a little bit lazy. But like again, we're leading up to what happens in the next episode, which we'll get to. But first, yes. we have to talk about Kipo and Scarlamane. Yes. Oh, boy. And Leo. And Leo. <laughs> <laughs> the 
That was in sync for me. I hope it shows up uh, like me that too. on the recording. That was great. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so Kipo is trying to essentially trying to do the thing where it's like, I can change your heart, right? Mm-hmm. Like I can change how, you know, all this pain you've been through. I can show you there's a better way. And you don't have to be like this mm-hmm. to Scarlamane. To be fair, she is doing it in a in what I imagine is a fairly, you know, chill way. Like I don't <laughs> Other than when she explicitly tells him to just throw why have a coronation at all? Just throw a party just and let all party. the humans go. I'm like, I'm sorry. Just throw a party and let all the humans go. Just throw a party. <laughs> just throw a party. <laughs> but playing the board game with him, right? And giving him, you know, I and attempting to reach him and become close yeah. to him in other ways, I do think was effective. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's a really nice way of showing him that the Oak family isn't just, you know, like rules and regulation kind of mm-hmm. thing, because he doesn't really know, like he hasn't known who Leo Oak is now. Mm-hmm. Right. Like Leo Oak has spent the last 13 years raising a daughter and, you know, has those parental, you know, more of that parental spirit in him now than he did before. Right. And like and he genuinely does feel bad for the way scarlamagne has been treated. But I mean, you know, to your point from last week, we keep coming back to what Hugo would need. And I'm just like, <sighs> but what if we like dealt with. The monkey as he is. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, what if we just treated Scarlemagne like Scarlemagne, which is kind of what Kipo is doing, right? And yeah. I think that that's no, why Kipo... No, Kipo 100% accepts Scarlemagne for who he is. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think it's, you know, like, she definitely does say, you know, but that doesn't seem like something Hugo would have wanted because Scarlemagne is like, I've always wanted to be a king. Yeah. And Kipo's like, are you are you sure about that? Because I don't think Hugo always wanted to be a king. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I feel like Hugo just wanted some freedom, which I wish she had gotten to that point. Mm-hmm. But she did not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, instead, it was just like, well, Hugo, Hugo didn't know what he wanted. Hugo wanted hugs and a warm blanket, you know, <laughs> his star, his star blanket. And <laughs> poor Kipo's like. I love like, hugs and warm blankets. I love, I love hugs and and star blankets. I want hugs and star blankets. Um, What's funny with that, though, and not to go off on Scarlamagne too, too long, because we already did that, <laughs> is that Hugo actually really did want to be king. You know? Yes, exactly. He actually like, really did. He wanted to I'm be sick. rich and have finery. It was like, I think it was, I think it was the freedom, but it was also the finery. And it was also yeah. like, I don't know, just like the chance to be in the spotlight, which he no, I mean, so I, desperately wanted. And it's That's like exactly Scarlamagne's, what that is. Scarlamagne's perspective of Hugo is kind of twisted, right? Like when he thinks about when he thinks about who he was when he was Hugo and he thinks about how like he was so the pathetic, which is the word that he uses to describe himself and so weak. But anyway, but anyway, moving on from that, Scarlamagne. <laughs> but yeah, but like the reason he wants to be king is so that he can be the one in charge. He yeah. can be the one who has all this power and has this and will have people doing things for him as opposed mm-hmm. to him doing things for other people. Because he does not want to do that. He just doesn't want to do that. Because it's again, also kind of a self esteem thing. Oh, yeah. Hugo had absolutely zero freedom. Mm-hmm. And it would make perfect sense to me if you had the kind of personality that was like, if you enjoy the finer things of life, but you're constantly in a room with probably, I would assume, secondhand toys Mm -hmm. and you're not even like, he's acting like a person and he has absolutely zero clothes except for this like star blanket who he sleeps with. You know what I mean? Like it just, it felt very real and genuine that it's like, yeah, all Hugo did kind of want was his star blanket and hugs. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> he didn't because Hugo also couldn't see himself being king, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. and it wasn't until he came into his power that it was like Scarlemagne can be king. Yes, he can be king. Right. And right, like right. having that possibility is a totally different ballgame. I'm mm-hmm. going to stop talking about Scarlemagne now. I promise. <laughs> I'm sorry, listeners. Well, like, look, we love we love our boy. We do. Yeah, we do. Why don't, why don't we shift and talk a little bit about Kipo and Leo? 
in yeah. these episodes because I think that the tension between the two of them is really, really interesting as well. I completely agree. I think uh, I really enjoy that, you know, Kipo initially, you know, like you see this evolution of Kipo coming to save her father. And it's like, actually, she kind of can't save her dad. Mm-hmm. Like trying to save her mother, she can't save her mother. Mm-hmm. And then trying to like talk her way through this problem. And then the more she learns about her parents' past, the more she's like, no, you did the wrong thing. Yes. Like, I, you, you know, that is not, that is not the dad I know. You completely abandoned him and gave up hope. And right. you would like, you know, it's that, it's also that moment of like, but you didn't do that with me. And I, I think she has some of, I'm going to call it survivor's guilt, but that's not what it is. Mm. There's a term in like abusive households where it's like, there's the golden child. And then there's the one who's constantly abused. Mm-hmm. And like, she was essentially the golden child. Right. Of this little family that they had. Now, granted, you know, Leo essentially abandoned him while Kipo was still a baby. But like Scarlet was still out there. Yeah. Doing stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? So it's no, I 100 percent agree with you. I think it's 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 that. Right. And what's terrible for her is, you know, if if you were or if she were growing up in an abusive household where she, the golden golden child, could see what was being done to the other child. Right. Mm-hmm. Then that creates that creates a men- and that creates basically an image of you know, the parent or guardian in that situation, right? Where you kind of understand that they have both sides to them. But Kipo didn't grow up in that situation. Kipo grew up with just her, right? In her house, being, you know, brought up in this super loving way. So she basically was super idolized her dad, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, this perfect image of her dad is shattered. And she's realized, like, oh, no, he's not the amazing father I thought he was, or maybe he is, but he wasn't too... He's not absolutely perfect. He's exactly... Maybe he's no longer my hero. Like, maybe he is also flawed. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where I really love, like, you know, that impulsivity can come out in... And we've seen it before. But sometimes Kipo is extremely blunt. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I I put in my notes. I don't remember which episode it was, but it was like, Kipo read you for filth. And Kipo, like reads oh, Leo yes. for filth instantly and then of course because it's her father she's like uh well this was this was episode <laughs> nine I assume you're talking about when they were arguing while crafting which yes. is absolutely <laughs> the worst time to argue maybe you know, know what it's slightly better than arguing I don't see how over... glitter is gonna save the day <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then I and then she responds, I really don't think you should just give up on someone you helped raise. Yeah, like just drops it. Just drops <laughs> the facts. Um and I like I just I really like that it's not an easy conversation and it's not smooth and mm-hmm. like it's not solved in 28 minutes. You know, like even even at the end of the next episode, and we'll get to that, but even at the end of the next episode, we have to deal with like the reality of, you know, her father being correct that she can't reach Scarlemagne. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, sometimes you just can't reach people and it doesn't make it any, like it doesn't make it hurt any less. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just, it's really true about like, you know, like the destructive friends or the destructive family members that we, you know, we either have in our own, you know, communities and we know personally or we have a friend who is dealing with something like that. And it's like and it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard because like you have if you have a brother who is like slowly tearing himself apart because mm-hmm. he wants something that, you know, is going to destroy him. Right. It's. You know, it's just, it's really, really difficult. And you want to reach them, but sometimes you just can't. Right. And that's the hard lesson that Kipo has to learn. But she hasn't learned it yet. She has decided to make Scarlamane a blanket of stars. (laughs) A star blanket with glitter. A star blanket (laughs) with glitter. Because, listen, all of of that is true. (laughs) Right. All of that is 100% true. And at this point in the episode... Kipo hadn't really tried yet, so she's going to try at least once, right? She's going to mm-hmm. try at least once to reach. And Leo Scarlamane. helps her. Mm-hmm. He does. And Leo helps her. And there's, uh, I love the moment where, like, Scarlamane, like, 
wants the truth from Leo and Leo is like, you know, talking about what they were doing and it's, and also how, and how also solidly, how amazing Kipo is. <laughs> like, how solidly Kipo destroyed the mod frogs <laughs> because she did. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't even a fight, which I think is exactly what Leo says. That's exactly what he says. My daughter, it wasn't even a fight. My daughter's amazing. <laughs> My daughter's amazing. And just like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> I love that moment, too, because Scarlamine also has this genuine, like, you've surprised me, you know? Mm-hmm. And, like, I think this really, really clear moment of what feels like vulnerability, he's not actually vulnerable, right? Mm-hmm. Like, he's still posturing and he's still, you know, he's still Scarlamine. But, right. like, he has this moment of, like, that was really sweet, mm-hmm. you know? And I think... I don't know if he considers it for what it is, for what Kipo wants him to consider it as, but like the moment is there, right? And it didn't have to be there. Yeah. I mean, um, Scarlamine takes this in kind of an interesting, an interesting direction, right? Which mm-hmm. we can, you know, we we might just have to roll right into episode 10 yeah. and just kind of start well, talking yeah, the- about that because <laughs> like when when Leo tells Scarlamine honestly that because he's hypnotized. Right. Mm -hmm. That Kipo proved that what Leo did was wrong. Right. And then Leo says, I shouldn't have given up on you. And I'm I'm sorry. You know, it was wrong of me to give up on you. And I'm sorry it took Kipo to point that out. It could have been this very sweet kind of tender moment of connection. But I think what ends up happening is that it just further solidifies in Scarlamane's mind the fact that he's a victim Mm -hmm. and the fact that Leo hurt him. And now deserves everything that's coming to him. Scarlamane, instead of, because what Kipo essentially says is like, if you give people a choice, they might enjoy your company and they might follow mm-hmm. you anyway. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they get to have this really lovely bonding over at the piano, which, by the way, Kipo can also play the piano and she plays right. a guitar. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's in my notes too. I was like, I guess she can play the piano. <laughs> Uh, it's fine. It's fine. Everyone She's never has seen musical. one before, but it's okay. <laughs> Everyone has musical talent in the <laughs> dystopia. It's fine. It's I mean, not how least, any of that works, but it's at fine. At least she had a guitar in the burrow. There literally wasn't a piano in the burrow. But, oh, but that's, that's the thing. So quick there, piano <laughs> tangent is like a piano is as someone who has had to move pianos from apartments mm-hmm. to houses to apartments, etc. Mm-hmm. It is not an easy thing to bring with you. No. If you are running around in the apocalypse, you know what's great? You strap a guitar to your back and then you keep running. Mm-hmm. Like a piano is it's, it's, it's like what did you, what could you possibly have had? A Casio? <laughs> like a plastic? How would you have plugged it in? Because they have no electricity. Because <laughs> they have no electricity. Okay. Piano tangent over. <laughs> but, you know, they, they have this really lovely bonding moment. And they consistently have these bonding moments throughout mm-hmm. this episode. And, like, Kipo's big thing is, like, what if you just ask them to follow you? And, right. and you know, Scarlamane is like, but nobody wants to be ruled. Absolutely mm-hmm. nobody. Like, I have to demand... And specifically not by him. Yeah, specifically not by him, which uh, uh, a little moment of like uh, understanding who he really is there, which I'm like, yep, <laughs> this is why I like how complicated he is, is because he under like and on some level he understands that he himself is broken mm-hmm. and that he needs to force people to follow him because he is the kind of leader who needs absolute loyalty and do what I say. There's a word yes. for that, like a non-questioning subject Mm, mm -hmm. like he needs he needs people who will not you know who will follow him blindly for lack of a better word and and you know that's well we'll see how that goes in the next episode but like they leave it on this like maybe we made a difference because at the coronation he starts with his uh with the music that he and Kipo sort of chose and it's like oh it's our song and right. then he's brought in by the giant Mega Monkey song. Yeah. In a very intimidating display of power. Mm-hmm. Complete with, complete with, and let's just cut right to it, gilded mod frogs. He has fully yep. 
He has killed the mod frogs. Or, well, three of them anyway. Not all of them. Where is Jamak? <laughs> Just like, where is Jamak? I think Jamak is having adventures with the with the with the theaters. That's I think true. he's gone off to join the bards for a bit <laughs> and sing the song of Kipo. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think that's actually where he is because I think they approached him at the end of that. At no, the end that of is the where Brunch that is beach. where we last saw him. It's just like yeah. <laughs> We need him. He's living his best life. Let him <laughs> let him have a moment. No, but yeah, like the leader of the mob frogs is gilded, and and Scarlamane offers this to Kipo mm-hmm. as a like. Well, you gave me a gift. You gave mm-hmm. me this beautiful blanket that I wear as a cape. I'm giving you a gift. They will never be able to hurt you again. And like, can I ask you? Is he being? Do, is your read on that that he is? that he genuinely considers that a gift or does he know that this is sinister and that none of these choices are real i think it's a combination of both mm. i really i don't think he's i don't think he's as aware of himself enough to say because you know because again he has he has these dark tendencies right but he has these dark tendencies because he doesn't understand why people are just nice to each other. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand, you know, without a give and take. And he doesn't understand, like, people just doing nice deeds for the sake of doing nice deeds. I fully believe that. I fully believe that he's not, like, he got a gift and now he has to do something in return. (laughs) And just like Wolf, Mm -hmm. where she's, like, you know, it has it has to be this constant, you know, even, I know we joked about it, but it's like, you're learning his weaknesses. You Mm. know what I mean? Like, It is not a you're trying to make friends. It is never you're trying to make friends just for the heck of it. It is you are you are being a tactician and all this other stuff. And I think for Scarlamagne, it's a it's just it's, you know, as baseline as it is, it's just like a display of dominance. Mm -hmm. And I hate describing it that way because it's far more complicated. But like, you know, he's also a mandrel monkey. Yeah, it's true. And <laughs> he's extremely flamboyant. And I'm just also like, he is he is trying to, like, you know, just like in the lab, how he would try to say, like, I can protect you. I can use this to make them do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. And I can protect you from them. This mm-hmm. is that same, like, Energy. my... Yeah, okay. Yeah, like, my love is I am protecting you. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that means killing your enemies so that they don't come after you anymore. Like, I genuinely believe that he thinks that is a good thing. Like, these mod frogs can never hurt you again because they're dead. He had to survive on the surface just like Wolf did, so I think that that is a good... That is an an interesting connection to make. That he and Wolf and characters like Jamak, right? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Wolf and and Jamak specifically are not cast as villains in this show, but Mm -hmm. they they would kill. To protect Kipo too, they absolutely would. Yeah, I believe I believe that a hundred percent. So <laughs> I yeah, think, you're right. That's what this is. I think if Wolf had the opportunity to kill Doctor Amelia without having any witnesses, I feel she would do like, it. I feel I, like I, she'd I, do it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> feel like it wouldn't be. It wouldn't even be a hard decision. But like, <laughs> so there's this conflict happening after Scarlamagne gives this big grand speech to everyone. Of like, join me or perish. Mm-hmm. And then turns to Kipo and is like, but I gave them a choice. And Kipo is so distraught. You might as well have given them no choice. I like, mean, they're- like, poor Kipo. She's just so gullible. She's so I gullible. Know. Like, you can see her face in the background animators. Just chef's kiss. Great job with I know. this. So good. <laughs> but every time Scarlamagne started a sentence and was like, I'm going to give you a choice, you see Kipo's face light up. And then when he finishes his sentence, it falls apart immediately. And she does that two, three times, I think. <laughs> Up I mean, on that balcony. You know, yeah, it it has, and again because like <laughs> we want him to have changed because we yeah. saw how different they were together. Mm-hmm. You know, we got to see how Scarlamagne was very friendly and almost brotherly towards her, mm-hmm. and like that's one of the reasons I genuinely think that he's he thinks he did a good thing. Yeah, he's like, yeah, you're not the mod frogs can't hurt you anymore. I don't understand why you're upset. I gave them a choice, and like. It's a choice that arguably Hugo had of Mm -hmm. like, 
you are going to run on this treadmill and you are going to give me your pheromones or we're just going to kill you. Like, right. You or know. we'll hurt Leo or we'll hurt Song. And so, yeah. sure, yes, technically he had a choice. And I could see him, I could see him being the kind of character who, who would say, like, listen, I know I'm putting myself in a position of power, but also think about the alternative, right? Because right. zooming yeah. ahead into zooming ahead into episode 10 just a little bit. First mm-hmm. of all, one of the alternatives is that all of the animals were fighting each other, not animals, all of the mutes. All of the yeah. mutes were fighting each other all the time, right? So they were mm-hmm. living in a world that was violent and chaotic and scary and terrible. But under under Scarlemagne's rule, he could in theory create a society in which there is order, right? Instead of chaos, and he could argue that that is a version of peace, even if it isn't technically peaceful. And then the other right. side of it is, before him and before the mutes came into power, they had the humans, and the humans destroyed the planet. The humans yeah. are the reason <laughs> the entire planet is a disaster zone, and for some reason, and, and one borough, one borough has access to electronics and <laughs> and technology, but no one else does. You're, you're never going to be able to let that one I'm go. I'm never going to be able to let that go. <laughs> the science borough, the one science borough on the whole planet. No, but, no, but you're absolutely correct. And it's like animals were under human control. Mm-hmm. Now I control all the humans mm-hmm. and I can make them do things for you. And we could even turn them into peacekeepers and we can make sure. And yeah. exactly as you said, like I can create order out of chaos. Mm-hmm. I can unite everybody because he was already starting to do that. It's, yes. a, it's a fairly compelling argument. I mean, you know, for all we talk about the mutes being very, you know, obviously advanced and a lot of them talking and having hierarchies and things like that. It's I think it goes back to our point about how a lot of these mute clans and packs are built off human humanistic relationships. Mm -hmm. And like it's very human to be like, you know what, maybe we do need some law and order. Mm -hmm. And even if that, you know, law and order is problematic (laughs) (laughs) okay but let's zip into episode 10 because the other side of that coin is and you know this is kind of the this is kind of the choice that the show has given us right Mm -hmm. because Kipo hasn't necessarily presented a third choice yet she just knows she wants the world to be a kinder place but the options are basically either Scarlemagne rules the world or Dr. Amelia rules the world and both Mm -hmm. of those things are terrible (laughs) Yes. And so Kipo's third choice for episode 10 (laughs) is giving everybody back their free will. Yes. Kind of. (laughs) Kind of. Kind of. Sort of. But giving basically giving Mulholland free reign inside these people who are gassed to (laughs) unhypnotize them. And so that they can't follow Scarlemagne's orders. I just think it's so and it's funny like, <laughs> that literally every single human now just has Mulholland in their brain. And the thing I is, know. like, <laughs> yeah, can we talk about that for a second? <laughs> so freaking lucky that Kipo has gotten Mulholland to be the not person that he is today. The, 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 the creature that the he entity. is today, the entity <laughs> that he is today, <laughs> because if he wanted to, he could fully just mind control the entire planet and, yep. you know, yep, absorb yep, yep. them. Yep, yep, uh, yep. Thank, thank God he has a conscience, I guess. You're welcome. <laughs> because, yeah, they're <laughs> every single human. Just has yeah. a hole in their brain. Including the giant mega monkey. <laughs> Just saying, the giant mega money monkey is probably like food for days. Just saying. Oh my gosh. Mulholland is actually super cute, though. Like when he when he morphs into that kind of knight character with a helmet and a sword, and he's like, I "I'm here to be your new brain roomie and keep those pesky pheromones away." I was like, "Oh, I know." Strangely I charming. Roomie. strangely charming charming in a way i hadn't expected slightly disturbing very disturbing being that he is electing to just keep those pesky pheromones away but again could just mind control every single human if he really wanted to if you really wanted to i mean again like i you know like this is the magic of kipo (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like Kipo meets you and your life changes. Mm-hmm. And like Mulholland's a great example of that because again, he's, he's just there just to be a neutral party. 
practically. Right. Like he's there to even the playing field. Because the thing is, is as soon as you take all those soldiers away from Scarlemagne, he has no kingdom anymore. No kingdom, but he's still a giant monkey. <laughs> you know, or, also or ape, true, I suppose. <laughs> right? Oh gosh. Did we ever look up? We ever look up if it was? Does he have a tail? Were ape? Why can't I imagine whether he or not a, he has uh, a tail? Oh no, he does have like, a tail. Then he's a monkey. Oh, is is that how it is? Yeah, tail equals monkey. No tail equals ape. But I just I was seeing both versions of him in my brain, and I couldn't remember which one is right. One of those like one, like those Mandela pictures. <laughs> yeah, right. Like you have to unfocus to refocus. Mandela effect pictures. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they are, yeah, mandrels are monkeys. They are the okay, largest of tails. all monkeys. Ooh, yeah. So again, like, listen. Yes, it was absolutely crucial that Scarlemagne's army be taken away from him and that they basically yeah. find a way to neutralize his pheromone, but he's still a giant yeah. monkey, which is why most of episode 10, with the exception of the last part of it, which we need to talk about, but most of episode 10 is just one long, complicated fight scene between almost every single character we've encountered up until this point in the show. Yeah. I mean, the notable exception is Jamak, which again, where's Jamak? But you're uh, you're right. I'm glad he's I'm glad he's, he's with the theaters. He, he's <laughs> off with the theaters. He's living his best life. He's fine. <laughs> but yeah, it it is this extremely elaborate fight scene. It's psychological, which mm-hmm. I think is great. Mm-hmm. It has you know, like again, you have the look. The fight scene is a little too complicated to do a blow by blow. No, we can't. But the, <laughs> the just watch the it. Punchline, yeah, just watch it. The punchline is by the end of it, although I will say this, Scarlemagne offers Kipo a quote-unquote choice mm-hmm. of like, I'll let everyone go and only keep the people who want to follow me if you stay with me and kill your father. Yes, guild your father. Oof. Guild which, your father. Of course which she... Which would kill him. <laughs> which would kill him, which of course she doesn't agree to, right? Yeah. And then you have this moment, and this is why I think it's just his brain eschewing like what is good and what is bad. Mm -hmm. Like we have this moment where he says, no one ever chooses me. Mm -hmm. All I can think of is like, this is someone who just has an extremely different view of right and wrong. Right. Right. Like their protection, their definition of protection is completely off balance. Their definition of like, What's yours is mine and mine is yours is completely off balance. And so when she says she's not going to kill Leo, Mm -hmm. he is like, yep, I knew it. No one ever chooses me because you would have had to do that to be on my side. Well, my other favorite, my other favorite thing about that moment is that when he presents her with that quote choice and when she when she chooses her father. Right. And Mm -hmm. when she chooses not to kill her dad. It's almost like a gotcha moment for him, you know? All of a sudden, yeah. he's like, aha, I knew you wouldn't choose me. And then he turns around. This is episode 10, by the way, you know? It, it, yeah, we <laughs> finally did it. He, he turns he turns around, and he commands the humans to begin the games. The stadium is filling up with the pheromone. And that's when you see Kipo's face change. And that's when you realize, and that's when the show reveals that everyone has been, not infected, but there, there's got to be a better verb, <laughs> but has been infected with Mulholland, right? Yeah. And so I like that it I I like this moment because I think that it's almost like the board game foreshadowed this moment because yes. Scarlemagne loved the board game because he loved the strategy and the intrigue and the the manipulation but Kipo won the board game. And right. Kipo won here too. Because yep. Scarlemagne did not know that she had a backup plan. He really thought he had her and they were just going to be his they were just going to be his enslaved humans and play his games. But uh, I mean Scarlemagne nope. also allowed her free reign of his whole compound cuz he was so freaking confident. He really I just know. like <laughs> He did and not think she that just, she had it in her. She just kept pouring Mulholland into the vats. <laughs> and like eventually Mulholland is just hanging out, waiting to be like dispersed throughout mm-hmm. all the humans under his control. Like this plan was great. This Such was a good plan. well thought out. It was mm-hmm. not impulsive. Mm-hmm. She had to play that long game. I don't think we've seen her execute a plan like this before. And no. I also just I love the like I should have saved the boom for the end. <laughs> 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 but 
yeah, so then there's more fight sequences. Yeah, it's Again, like fight, 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 fight. I mean, fight. all the different all the different parts of it are basically that like the stadium is filling up with gold, right? So all of yes. the mutes are realizing like we got to get out of here. So all the mutes are trying to get out of the stadium. The Tipper Cats are there. The Tipper Cats are helping are helping Troy and the twins. The Mega Monkey is there, and the Mega Monkey has scooped all of the humans into a giant building is and is like carrying them out of carrying them out of the stadium, right? And then while the, also the, being attacked by the other minions of Scarlet exactly. Mane, which is kind yes, of amazing. Yes, while also being attacked by the flying primates on the flamingos. And then on the balcony is just the core team versus Scarlet Mane, right? Mm-hmm. But this all goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is that Scarlet Mane, even without his army, is still a giant monkey. And so he is so strong that people can't take him out unless mm-hmm. she goes Jaguar. And she won't go Jaguar because Benson dropped his backpack by accident into the molten gold. And now he thinks the journal ha- and the anchor have been destroyed. Except, of course, they haven't because we know that Dr. Amelia took it. Right. <laughs> even, in the sh- even though the show hasn't told us that, uh, that yet. They <laughs> haven't told us that yet. We know. We <laughs> know. But yes, the... You know, it's this it's this moment of like your anchor is gone. Yes. If you turn, you won't be able to turn back. So she is able to sort of defeat Scarlemagne kind of on her own. And she knocks him out quickly, but he wakes right back up. I know. Well, but then he <laughs> runs and like hits his head or something. No, he gets on his flamingo. And because yes. there's too much gold, mm-hmm. some of it gets mm-hmm. on the wing of the flamingo. It's a very Icarus moment. Oh, yeah. So and, like. Good crashes into the into the stairs and that's what knocks him out the whole coliseum is chaos and they're like they're trying to save all these like they the humans were like the first to be saved but there's all these mutes and they don't know Mm -hmm. where to put the mutes and like there's nowhere for them to go they can't get out and kipo is watching all this chaos around her and is just like or i could be a giant jaguar and knock over the tree and the gold would stop filling up the Coliseum and everyone would be safe. Yeah. Oh, and this is a great episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My super chaotic summary of it. Whoops. <laughs> Dear listeners, no, if it's you a haven't bit, seen this a episode, bit. you should probably just watch it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It's a little bit uh, the Adventure Zone live show. <laughs> or it's like, we're just going to zoom through the ending real fast, everybody. Uh, I hope you watch the episode because uh, good luck. But like, you know, she she... Turns Mega Jaguar, you know, she sort of has this moment of like, no, this is what I have to do. I have to do this to save everybody. She Mm -hmm. turns Mega Jaguar. She's pressing on that tree. Mom sees her and comes to help, but Mm -hmm. gets gold, gets gilded. One of her hands gets gilded by accident. Mm -hmm. And this is that moment where like, and I love what the animators did here because you can see her thinking, I need more power. I'm not strong enough to do this. And that's when we get the full on transformation of Mega Jaguar with her complete with like weird mullet hairdo and like yeah, three four tails, tails uh, and like yeah. her tufted ears. I mean, she's finally just hit the next stage in her evolution. It was exactly. very, it was very Pokemon what happened. It was. And I don't mean it that was. as a dig, it was perfect. <laughs> No, no, no. We let, we stand Pokemon on the show. Pokemon's great. Uh, she she definitely entered her final form. Uh, or is it this her final great. form? We don't know. Or is it? It's pretty. It's pretty. I got spoilers for you. It's pretty. You're much like her it's final pretty form. final. <laughs> it's pretty final. I mean, she look. She was able to push over a gigantic tree. If that's not mm. her final form, man, <laughs> I don't know what else we gotta super we gotta mess OP. with. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But yeah, like she's she's able to do it and she stops the gold and the gold stops just in time before it gets the timber cats and the and the humans who've managed to get up the stairs. Mm-hmm. And then we have this moment of like she's like groaning and growling and she can't change back. Yeah. And the whole yeah. team and like that drops like a like a you know, like the worst penny. Like that penny drops and everyone is instantly like but it's upset. Like- we, she knew, right? She mm-hmm. knew that the anchor was destroyed, and she knew that this was the choice that she was making. But yeah, she's yeah. going to save an entire stadium of people if she can. And so she did. Now, before we get into the super emotional bit of this episode, what I also like about, about this moment is that the show chose to intersperse it with cuts of Dr. Amelia giving a speech 
to the mm-hmm. humans inside of the building, right? Because yes. again, Mega Monkey scooped up all the humans in a building and took them somewhere else. And Mondu was supposed to get him into the tunnels to safety. But of course, Dr. Amelia comes across them and she starts giving this whole speech about how humans don't have to live underground and how we they have to save the mutants from themselves we have, have to, to fix them we have cure to cure them. them exactly and it's like zipping back and forth between her talking about curing and fixing mutes and saving them from themselves and poor Kipo trying to turn her back herself back into a human and just failing miserably and that yeah. was fantastic no the the dichotomy there and then of course having wolf talking and the difference between like wolf and dr amelia Mm -hmm. And, like, I just really like the, I like the choices that were made for, like, how Dr. Amelia is presented and how Wolf is presented of, like, a small, young, black girl talking about how, you know, she she knows exactly who Kipo is and Kipo brought her out of her shell Mm -hmm. and, like, that's, you know, and that's amazing. Like, she's never had a friend like that before. Mm -hmm. And all of this stuff. And then you have Dr. Amelia just sowing this fear as like an older white woman. (laughs) Yeah. And speaking of sowing fear, she explicitly says, we're humans. And when we were on top, the surface thrived. And it's Mm -hmm. like, did it though? Like, Mm -hmm. look around, lady. (laughs) But of course, everyone who's listening to her is just so scared that they're buying it, that they're buying right into it. Like they oh, yeah. see this. No, they as, buy it immediately. Except for except for Troy's dad, of course. <laughs> except for Troy's dad, the real <laughs> MVP. Away, who sneaks away with Mondu during the speech. She didn't get him, but she got most of them because yeah. they're scared. I mean, they've also to be to be entirely fair to the humans in this tunnel. Mm-hmm. They've just spent days being under the influence of an extremely powerful mute. Yes. And not fair. having control of their bodies, not having control of their minds, and not being mm-hmm. able to like they also like they destroyed Ratland. Like they just like they have caused some serious trauma to other, you know, like across the world, you know, under the the influence of this really, really powerful mute. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm not gonna sit here and be like don't have this opinion because like I get it but also the same way that hey Scarlamine some of the things he's saying are not wrong humans Mm -hmm. destroyed the planet and all these other things the message Dr. Amelia is giving you is also incorrect yeah like there's just there's you know there's no world in which uh, it's just, it's so unfortunate because it's one of those things. And again, like, this is why you can count on the kids and why you can count on Troy's dad to be like, actually, she's really wrong about that because we've spent time with mutes and we like, we understand, we get it. Mm-hmm. And like, the thing is, is just like people, not every person is going to be bad. Not every person is going to be good. Not every mute is going to be bad or good. Yeah. And, you know, they're complicated. They're <laughs> They're just like people. No, they're, they're not I just know, like but people. They, but they like, are. They are, right? Because, yeah. yes, Scarlamane has done terrible things, and so have humans, right? Exactly. Exactly. Humans could humans start wars. Humans get involved in genocide. Then all sorts of terrible things happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So sometimes a certain person gets in power, <laughs> and you maybe don't want that person to be in power, but it's not going to be any it's not going to be any better just because humans are on top, right? Exactly. But of course, they're not thinking this way. <laughs> no. And again, I don't really fault them for this because a lot of that is like, I don't know. I can't even say that, like, if I was in that situation, would I follow Dr. Amelia? I don't know. Maybe. They you don't know? know anything about her, right? Exactly. Well, they don't, they don't know anything about her, but they know she's human. Mm-hmm. And she's a doctor. And she's and a doctor. she has access to technology and no one else does. I mean, and she's... <laughs> Well, I don't know if they know that, actually. Does she have any technology on her when she approaches they'll see, them? They'll see it soon enough. <laughs> this is, that's true. That's true. Uh, but, yes, yeah, so she has this impassioned speech mm-hmm. to sort of rally them to, to her side. And they all accept. Mm-hmm. All of them. It's just, it's so sad. But, in, but um, to get to the super emotional part of this episode is, as I was saying, like, you have Wolf also 
you know, talking to Kipo and allowing herself to be vulnerable again and allowing herself to be like, right, but Kipo, Kipo knows who she is. Like, Mm -hmm. Kipo is the strongest personality among us. Like, she, she fights for the friendships and she fights for her friends and for other people and for people she's not even friends with. Like, Mm -hmm. she fights to create, you know, these connections. And so what does Wolf do? (laughs) She sings the karaoke song because Kipo taught her to sing. (laughs) And like, what a great, what a great moment for Wolf also, because on top of teaching her to sing and all of that, all of that, right? Kipo has taught her that, well, not nothing, but nothing is impossible, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because, and I don't think that, I don't think that Wolf would have stood up for a character or tried for someone else in this way when we first met her, right? So yeah, Kipo's totally changed who she is. But what was interesting for me in that moment, too, is that Wolf was the only one who was really trying to get Kipo to change back. Because right before Wolf's speech, Leo's dad says, it's okay, we'll still be a family, you know? Because Kipo's dad is thinking like, you're a jaguar now. <laughs> like, oh yeah. man, but you know what? My wife is a monkey. We're going to make it work, you know? <laughs> and so he's he's just kind of like, I'm so sorry, It's okay, but it's okay. We're still going to look at, this, at the stars and sing. And ben, Benson is apologizing because he knows it's his fault, quote, because right. he lost the anchor, right? And Wolf is like, ah, da, 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 no, <laughs> we're not giving up. <laughs> I also like that Dave is like, that's it? Like, is that really it? Is that, are we sure? You know, <laughs> like, it's not like Dave has completely given up, but Dave has no idea how to fix it. Right. Mm-hmm. So Dave is just like, but I, are we sure? Are we sure there's nothing we can do? <laughs> and, you know, and thank God there's Wolf. <laughs> yes. And then the karaoke, everyone else joins in too. Did you cry? I cried. Um, I not- feel like I cry every time I watch the end of season two. I don't know why. I just get a lot of feelings. I got a, I got a little teary. I didn't cry a lot, but I think that that's because a lot of, it, it happened so quickly. And I was yeah. like coming off of having feelings about Dr. Amelia's speech and the way her speech yeah. was cut with this. So it was almost like too many feelings. And then I just kind of short circuited. <laughs> <laughs> that's look that uh this show will do that to you it will 100 percent make you short circuit yes and yep. so anyway the brunch bunches song comes through kipo's little misty dream because of course there's a mini dream sequence where she has to face her jaguar self sure is <laughs> and then she changes back and she's kipo again yeah I also love that she was like, that was super scary. (laughs) Finally admitting that something was super scary. Can we not Mm -hmm. do it again? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, we've done it, right? So this is the setup for this is the setup. This is the setup for episode three. Dr. Amelia is in place to lead the humans. Season three. Yes. Dr. Amelia is in place to lead the humans against the mutes. Scarlamane is in the litter. And the timber cats have <laughs> <With> adopted everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I do. I like that the cats have decided. Like, no, you are now all all our humans. Our humans. <laughs> you will come. You will come back to our lairs. Anything for you, Kipo, summoner of the mega jaguar. Always knew you would cat me. <laughs> I know. I love it when he says that so much. It's so such so a so good much. Line. <laughs> <laughs> I guess looking ahead to season three, I expect that Dr. Amelia is going to be kind of the big bad in season three. But Scarlamane is also still in that litter very much alive. So TBD on what happens to him. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those like we have we have our we have our Darth Vader in jail. Yes. Now we have to see what Emperor Emperor Palpatine is going to do. (laughs) And we will figure it out based on that. Yeah. But Yes. One more thing. Do you have a one more thing? Do you want to go first? Do you have one more thing? I, I do. I think I do. Uh, okay. My one more thing is the way that Dave avoided being gilded by all the gold by <laughs> by constantly evolving and <gasps> slowly just running away from each plop of gold that came down <laughs> on the steps. And it was it was some really lovely, like classic comedy moment <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like Buster Keaton style almost where like he's in the right place at the right time and then the door yep. opens and he is not hurt 
I love Dave so much. I mean, one of my favorite, <laughs> another one of my favorite Dave moments in these couple of episodes is when he's naming his fists. Yes. Hammer, <laughs> Slamson. I love that one of them is Slamson because it's clearly a shout out to Benson. It's so cute. <laughs> so he's got the claw, the hammer, slams it, and little pound cake. And then it's revealed that little pound cake is actually like, like the, the horn, horn that thing, sticks yeah. out of Muscle Dave's head <laughs> and not, in fact, a fist. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Dave. All the Dave. All the Dave. Do you have one or are you just going to find a quote? <laughs> I mean, how about I end on the Timbercats because I love the Timbercats. You could always and end I on the Timbercats. The, I love Do they it. keep getting reintroduced to the show. I know. <laughs> I would have been so sad if we never got to see them again. <laughs> okay, so on top of I al- always knew you had cat and yeah, my favorite Timbercats moment is the one where the Timbercats are at the stadium as well, although they're kind of outside of the fray. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> Troy like pops out <laughs> of Yum Yin's tail. <laughs> and <laughs> Molly is like, <laughs> how did you oh, No, the twins pop out? Of uh, the twins pop out of Yum Yin's tail, and Molly, Molly is like, "How did you not feel them?" <laughs> and then Troy pops and then out of Troy her tail. Pops out of Molly, and she goes, "And I retract." <laughs> <laughs> and I retract my question. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how the humans all arrived at the stadium in time for the fight because the Timbercats brought them. Yes, yes. Which see 100%. is kind of a narrative shortcut that I'm okay with. See, I, it works. That works. That makes narrative <laughs> sense. Like, I know plot device anium, but it 100% tracks that, like, somebody could hide in a tail. And yes. we are over time. So <laughs> please uh, join us next episode, friends, where we talk about the first few episodes of season three. I think we're only going to do one and two just in case a lot happens because we mm-hmm. know a lot will happen. And... Uh, <laughs> And we'll, and we'll get, we'll in, see, we'll we'll get see involved then. talking about Scarlamane again, and then we'll yep. look at the clock and realize an entire hour has gone by. Yep. <laughs> it's just going to happen. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Oh, well. Well, <laughs> between now and then, we would love to hear from you. Please check us out at Binge O'Clock Pod on Twitter and Facebook, where you can answer the question, what is your favorite Pokemon evolution? You can also email us at pinchoclockpod at gmail.com. And don't forget, we have a Patreon. Find us at patreon.com slash bockpod. That's right. And tell your friends, tell your family, tell your loved ones, tell the live lobsters in your life about Binge O'Clock, and we will see you next time. <laughs>